We have better maps of the moon, Venus, and Mars than we do our own ocean floor. My name is Diva Raymond, and I'm a deep sea biologist. And through my work, I'm able to visit parts of the planet that no one has been to before. Seeing and discovering new species and new habitats in the process. I grew up in Trinan, Tobago, which is in the Caribbean. So it meant I spent a lot of time in nature, especially by the ocean. Through those experiences, I remember there being times where I just wanted to pull away that veil of water to know what was down there. And that kind of led me on to this degree in, and career in marine science. It wasn't until I went to the University of Southampton that I realized that the deep ocean is really important and we know so little about it. Often, you know, I'll spend between one and three months at sea on a research ship. And that's the time when we're gathering the samples, we're gathering the amazing video and photos that we then take back to the lab and work on for the rest of the year. Our work has been in parts of the ocean that no one has visited before that point, which means that often you're answering questions that no one has answered. To do deep sea science, we use a suite of tools. So things like remotely operated vehicles or ROVs. These can be about the size of a car, but you don't go in them. And they're attached to the ship by a tether and you're able to see live what the ROV is seeing on the seafloor. And you're also able to control it. So you can collect samples and put them in the baskets on the front, or you can use some sensors to collect various types of um, chemical or physical data. Um, but definitely the most exciting part and the most exciting tool is, of course, submersibles. There are chariots down into the deep ocean. You're actually able to go in them. Often it's between two and three people. And really, you know, it's this wild ride, not for, you know, anywhere between sort of four and nine hours down into this environment, which can feel very foreign, but ultimately is, you know, what you've studied for so long. Because it's such a privilege and so expensive, you really have to make the most of your time down there. So we just spend the entire time collecting as many samples and as much data as we can. And before you know it, you're on your way back up. So less than 1% of the deep ocean has ever been seen by human eyes or imaged with cameras. And that means that oftentimes when we go on these research cruises, no one has been there before, and therefore we're finding new species, we're finding new habitats, we're finding new behaviors. Like literally nearly every single research cruise that happens. And it's, yeah, an astounding thing to be part of. So as part of my PhD work, um, we discovered the first ever whale carcass in the Southern Ocean. You might think like, why is that an interesting thing? Well, in the deep ocean, there's not a lot of food. So when a whale carcass sinks down into the depths, it's like this feeding bonanza, basically. And it draws all these animals towards it and it goes through various stages during the decades that it will be there. But the coolest part of it was that there was this bone-eating zombie worm. That's the nickname. Real name's Osidax. And it's essentially this worm that only lives on the bones of animals in the ocean, mostly in the deep ocean. And it's incredibly beautiful. And they live like by burying their roots into the bones, using acid to dissolve the bone, and then sucking out the collagen. 
So when you're naming a species, there are loads of rules. You can't name it after yourself. You can't be rude. And um, oftentimes it's in Latin because Latin used to be um, always the formal language of science. Where we tend to poke fun more often is in the common names. And there have just been some absolutely incredible common names like the bone-eating zombie worm, the headless chicken monster, and Dumbo octopus. There's also this um, crab that's found living at hydrothermal vents in Antarctica. And um, it has a really hairy chest. And so it was nicknamed the Hoff Crab after David Hasselhoff. I mean, really, we get creative. <laughs> and it can often be quite fun going through that process. Because the deep ocean is such a, an interesting and oftentimes like really difficult place to live. I mean, it's near freezing, crushing pressures, not a lot of food, darkness. It means that animals down in the deep ocean have evolved, you know, a suite of incredible adaptations. And that means that often they have really useful properties. Perhaps an animal that has an enzyme in it could hold something about the cure for cancer. So as we're exploring more and more, we're finding that there are a lot of things that the deep ocean can not only teach us, but can also help us to solve some of these really huge challenges that face humankind now and in the future. So these are called polymetallic nodules, and they are one of the three main resources that in the future we may mine to get essential metals like nickel, manganese, um, and cobalt from. On every single research cruise that we go on, we see our impacts already. And oftentimes that is in places that no one has been before. So we'll find our trash or other forms of pollution. We'll see, you know, trawl marks from a fishing net that dragged along the sea floor. And more and more climate change, for instance, is becoming a, a really massive issue. A lot of deep sea animals are, um, they're called stenotherms, and it means they live within a very small temperature range. And so any increases to temperature, even if they're very tiny, will have quite a big impact on deep sea life. I think one of the biggest lessons that I've had during my career is that Humankind is absolutely like part of nature and having respect and empathy, um, not just with the rest of humankind, but also with nature is really important. That really will make things much easier for everyone in the long run.